Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, welcome to this session about our journey with Elixir at Helvetia Insurance. My name is André Graf, I, and I've joined Helvetia around three years ago as a solution architect. And uh, actually before joining Helvetia, I worked for around 10 years with Erlang, uh, with Erlang Technology. Um, I founded multiple companies and some of you may know uh, the VernMQ project, which is an MQTT broker, uh, which we've implemented in Erlang back then, and we've, which we've also open sourced. And yeah, but now I'm part of this awesome team at Helvetia. And when I've joined, I've, I've actually didn't expect to work on Elixir or Erlang anytime soon. I mean, come on, it's an insurance company in Switzerland. so. I was looking for another challenge there, and I've joined their container platform team, which is the team that manages Kubernetes on top of AWS, a lot of automation pipelines um, around it. And yeah, that's, that's where I start. So let's quickly, a uh, quick word about my employer, Helvetia Insurance. Um, it's and a main insurance provider in Switzerland, but also around the globe. We serve around 7 million customers around the globe with over 12,000 employees. Main market, I would say, still remains in Switzerland, where we serve around 1 to 3 million customers and roughly around 4,000 employees. Um, 500 of, around 500 of those employees work in IT, and of those 500, around 200 work in software engineering. So as mentioned, when I've started my um, position um, at Helvetia, I was as a part of the container platform team, but some team reorganization happened that happens at such a company, I've learned. Um, I found myself in a new team, which um, is uh, called Helvetia Integration Platform Team. So during this team reorganization, a couple of teams joined us, and each of those teams brought their own set of technology uh, with it. So we, from our um, container platform team, we were managing a Kafka infrastructure, as well as some Jenkins pipeline to automate all of it. And then we found ourselves with other technologies like uh, managed file transfer and uh, HTTP API gateway, as well as a central integration bus. So as you can see, those technology are all related to communications, different communication patterns. And um, we tried, or our goal was to increase the efficiency how such new integrations can be built, discovered and used. And obviously we had a problem with those, ex with those other technologies that joined our team because they were not really automatable. So um, yeah, we had to look uh, for solutions how we could automate them. So let's, let's see how we did it. Um, first, as you can see, this integration bus completely dis disappeared. We, we were able to decommission it in favor of a library called Apache Camel, which is used by our software engineers to implement trans uh, transformation uh, flows. Then um, the Jenkins pipelines disappeared. I come to, um, to the Jenkins part in a minute, why, why this was required. And Elixir come into play. Elixir came into play, which helped us automate all aspects around our Kafka um, platform. Um, now we were still using this managed file transfer and as well as this HTTP API gateway, we still use it today. Um, however, we wanted to shift some of those workloads to newer technologies which were better automatable um, from our perspective. So at that moment, um, we looked at uh, AWS-based solutions like the uh, API gateway from AWS um, to replace some of the APIs that were configured on the HTTP API gateway, as well as um, 
S3, S3 buckets to replace some of those managed file transfer workloads. And obviously, um, we didn't talk to AWS directly to, to automate this, so we used Terraform in between to, um, to provision this um, automatically for us. Terraform itself, um, many of you may know it, uh, it's a great tool, but it's not necessarily a tool that offers a nice abstraction of the underlying platform. So for, for example, we wanted to hide the details of how such an S3 bucket is provisioned or how such an API gateway is configured. So we needed a transformation layer and this transformation layer lives in the Elixir uh, part. So Elixir transforms um, kind of an abstraction model to Terraform code and then uploads the whole Terraform code to Terraform Cloud and Terraform Cloud um, does the rest for us. And also a little Phoenix use case is there. Um, we started with Phoenix for mainly visualizing internal processes for us. Um, actually, I'm not sure if I mentioned um, all of the stuff we automate, we actually want to provide a self-service for our users so that our users can use um, actually GitOps to provision all those resources. And how does such a self-service look like? Um, we have on the left um, a software engineer creating a pull request to a common Git repository. This fires an event. This event gets handled by our Elixir application, validating the pull request, providing feedback back to the user, pulling in some stakeholders, um, validating stakeholders' approvals, and so on. Assuming everything looks good, then the, um, the pull request can be merged, and then another event gets fired, which uh, triggers our reconciliation phase. And in the reconciliation phase, depending on the underlying infrastructure that we're aiming at uh, uh, for provisioning, we, for example, generate this Terraform code and, and do the rest. For those who are interested in this topic, we have a session exactly about this tomorrow, um, first session of the lunch in this room by my colleagues sitting in front uh, here. So, okay, um, let's quickly get into some technical challenges. I guess you all want to know the big technical challenges that we had at Helvetia regarding Elixir. And the good news is we basically had no technical issues. <laughs> yeah, so I, anyhow, I have to come up with a couple of examples of issues. So they are, yeah, pretty synthetic, but yeah, anyhow, I give you some examples. So as you might guess, we live in the Java land at Helvetia, so everything is tailored towards Java workloads. We have many Jenkins pipelines that were reusable for all our Java engineers. Um, all the deployments, CI, CD pipelines, they, yeah, they were there. They use the, the package repository from Sonatype called Nexus. And yeah, Sonatype Nexus has nice integrations for Node.js, I think for Python, even now as a Docker register, you can use uh, Nexus, but there's no, um, support for Elixir packages, which um, for us as a consequence, we couldn't really use the tooling that already existed uh, back then. And we had to come up with our own tooling for, for doing uh, CI CD mostly. There's actually an open uh, Jira uh, request, quite old, um, not much activity going on. Yeah. So what we do instead, we, de uh, we directly reference the Git um, reference, um, the Git tags and Git commit hashes in the mix AXS, and uh, we don't use a private hex uh, repository or something like this. It works for us, it's not ideal, especially because we have to maintain our own pipelines for, for deploying and, and building stuff. Um, same story for um, SonarCube. SonarCube is used in our Java pipelines as a quality gate for um, source code quality uh, metrics. And um, yeah, they don't support Elixir. Why should they, right? So um, we can't use this tool, can't use this quality gate. 
And as a consequence, we had to convince our information security team that with the Elixir tooling, we could also provide some good quality um, metrics. So yeah, that's what we did. Um, and what we use, we use the obvious tools that most of you know, um, Dialyzer, Credo, Formatter, Xref, um, during um, our deployment and, and, and uh, testing uh, pipelines. And um, yeah, not mentioned on this slide, um, we also use Sneak at our company. Sneak released Elixir support, which is great, but it's not on par with what they do for Java. Um, it's basically um, uh, scans for vulnerability in, in hex dependencies, which is also good, but it's not uh, yeah, on par with Java. Then um, another story, um, we use Splunk in Helvetia, like most enterprise companies. And the container platform I mentioned at the very beginning, actually all the containers running on this platform lock their logs into the same Splunk index, which is great for software engineers because they can share the logs and so on. However, it's not so great if your application actually logs everything. <laughs> and for those who know Erlang and Elixir, we have this, um, what we call, let it crash, which is awesome. It speeds up develop developer uh, efficiency, in my opinion. We don't have to care about everything, can go for the lucky path, um, which as a consequence uh, re uh, resulted in leaked sensitive data in this index. So. I'm not sure if you can see, it's not so important, but we basically leaked the bearer token of us um, because we didn't match a 400 uh, status code of, uh, of an HTTP response. I mean, why should I? We're, not, we're only interested in the 200 OK case, not in the 400 case, but yeah, in that case we leaked an, a bearer token. So for us, um, as a learning, we have to be very careful in which situations we can leak um, sensitive content and try to work around it, either by kind of have a, um, a, um, a try catch pattern or something like this, or in this case of HET poison, which we use, we just basically wrote a wrapper which strips away the response in every, uh, at the request in the response struct. So, um, those issues, as I said, are not really issues, right? And we hit them mostly in the beginning. Once we had our pipelines ready, then those issues were gone. So what did we do during the past uh, three years, basically? So when I've joined in early 2020, um, there were only those Jenkins pipelines managing Kafka, um, our Kafka platform. and. Thanks to these team reorganizations, we, had, we were in the situation where we have to think again, how should we write such self-service applications? And uh, for us, it gave us the chance to really think about technology. And for me personally, it was clear that I don't want to write yet another self-service using Jenkins pipelines, neither I wanted to use the Quarkus Java stack that was used in our Helvetia container platform. Um, so we run some POC basically to, to validate that Jenkins isn't required for, for building something like this. The technology Elixir wasn't really um, important at that point. It was more to validate the idea of, of having such a, um, a Git operator, as we called it in the beginning. And the POC was very successful, impressed all our managers, one sitting right in front here. <laughs> so, he gave us a go, we, we, we basically checked with, I guess, his manager, and then we just started out with Elixir, and released our first version of a self-service that targets, um, or that, that can fully provision HTTP APIs for us uh, by January 21. At that point, not on AWS API Gateway, but on the Red Hat Freescale API Management Platform, and then um, we learned about some limitations of, of Red Hat and uh, Freescale platform. We made a switch to Amazon API Gateway. Um, 
around in the middle of, of those two releases, we started developing um, what we call a micro gateway. It's basically a very tiny proxy, um, just a couple of hundred lines of code, which we use to um, kind of work around some of the limitations we encountered with AWS uh, API gateway. Um, yeah, another few limitations uh, we hit on the road. So actually this little proxy server sitting right between our gateways and the upstream backend served us very well. So we were able to actually fix some of the limitations of AWS API gateway right, right in there. Um, for example, um, um, request body validation based on XML schemas, like those funny things. Yeah. Yeah, and then some other stuff which we implemented and yeah. Um, now a very important learning out of it. Don't be afraid of those changes. For example, the change between Red Hat and Amazon API Gateway was quite a big change. It was an architecture change. We also changed the way we provision everything from plain HTTP requests to Terraform Cloud and all of that on a, on a production system. And we had to migrate um, APIs that were running on a production system and so on, but it was totally worth it. So um, also late 20, we started with a replacement for the managed file transfer. In this case, we used S3 buckets and we re released it in early 21. The fun story here is that this service was built by a Java developer who had to train himself in Elixir. And it was, it's kind of a sad story because he didn't uh, got the, 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 the Elixir experience <coughs> we wanted him to have because he had to use our buggy libraries all the time. We were by ourselves very busy implementing our stuff. We couldn't properly peer up with him. So I would apologize for it. So definitely try to give the best beginner experience to your Java developers. Um, that's a big learning for us. Then in, um, by the end of 2020, we started with a Kafka self-service, replacing those, uh, those Jenkins pipelines. We released it in mid-21. And then, yeah, some other refactorings going on there. And now in actually early 23, we, wanted, we want to move our Kafka workloads from our own Kafka cluster to the Confluent Cloud Platform, which also requires quite refactoring on our side. Um, the story here, um, the whole Kafka service was implemented by an external guy from an external consult co consultancy company. And uh, we heavily relied on him. He also had to train Elixir. It wasn't a problem at all. So don't be afraid of learning Elixir or, or tell an external guy to, to train it. But for us, um, having him at such a crucial part of our infrastructure and having the, um, the possibility to leave us within a couple of weeks was a problem because that's what he did. And uh, yeah. So for next time, we should better discuss those risks um, up front and, and not just uh, uh, yeah, let it happen. And then um, early 22, actually our first Phoenix project um, um, appeared, which is basically a playground for experimentation for us, um, learning about live view, learning about how can we connect Phoenix to our identity provider for, for OIDC authentication, like all those kind of topics which are interesting in an enterprise context. And, um, but it was mainly for experimentation purposes. Um, and then in early 23, we actually uh, pitched uh, that we write a new API catalog application in Phoenix. And thanks to this experimentation, early on, we were actually able to ship something very quickly, like just a, a month or I don't know, a little bit more, and we already had something working and actually provides already some valuable information, even though still buggy, of course, but yeah. So this early experimentation with new technology was very important for us so that we can really ship something very fast. So I'm finished very quickly. <laughs> so when, um, when I started 
early 2020, we had around 187 um, integrations, all managed with Jenkins. Those were all Kafka uh, topics. Then uh, end of 2020, we had around 500, yeah, 600 integrations and around 7,000 lines of Elixir code spread across six OTP apps. By the end of 21, we had around 1,800 integrations. Those were now S3, HTTP APIs, Kafka topics um, in right, 14,000 lines of code, Elixir, spread across 14 OTP apps. And then in, by the end of 22, it exploded. We had like 3,200 integrations, um, 30,000 lines of code spread across 30, uh, 15 OTP apps. Team size remained more or less stable during this time. And um, yeah. And this is actually the last bit that the official approval of Elixir in Helvetia happened around late summer 22. And at this point, we are um, able to use Elixir throughout um, the stuff we are working on, where our team is working on. So um, that's it about my talk. Um, I'm happy to answer your questions. All right, thank you, Andre. Um, we have time for enough questions. Um, I'm going to start with one. So, um, sounds like you had more like non-technical issues or issues challenges. Um, did you also have uh, challenges to convincing others to use Elixir? Well, during the time where we started, actually in our team there were some initiatives to bring in Golang. Um, for uh, some serverless workloads. And so there was a little competition going on between Golang and, and Elixir. Um, however, at that point, our, our services were, were already quite advanced and usable and already serve some production um, workloads. So um, we basically um, went with accepting both Elixir and Golang. Uh, and today, I'd say, um, most of the organization are not really aware of, of Elixir. So it's more like the, the teams around us who are aware of it. And there we uh, didn't have any big uh, or convincing problems, I'd say. Uh, right. Well, thanks for the talk. Really interesting one. Um, I have a question. So um, any examples of the toughest questions you had to answer to your management on why Elixir? Mm -hmm. Um, and then another one is something happened, right? When there were no more questions about Elixir. So what happened? Well, um, when we when we came or or this officially uh, approval in in Elixir, it works through an, an enterprise architecture board where you have you set up your proposal, like why is this technology relevant for us, and so on, and. The whole um, proposal was around actually the features of, of Erlang, like reliability, failure isolations, fault tolerance, like those kind of aspects of the beam, which made Elixir such a good fit for our problem domain. And at that point, actually, we, we were, it was a little bit shaky, like what happened? Now we are two, more than two years in the game, and what should we do now? And actually, one person of this enterprise architecture board mentioned, well, you can do this with Java. Why should we do? Why should we do this with Elixir? Obviously, for me, with a plus ten years background in Erlang, I know you could do it with with, with Java, but you don't want to do it with Java. And it was kind <laughs> it was kind of difficult to argue with a person who has only a Java background about these kind of problems. So for me, those were kind of the, the difficulties. Yeah. Um, maybe another one regarding recruitment. I mean, all the companies that we work with um, are typically, or external consulting companies we work with, focus on Java technology. So everybody thinks, well, you need a Java engineer, just you get one. You, you pay the, 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 yeah, the bill and you get one. And 
early on we realized that actually our stack is much more than just Elixir. It's Terraform, it's AWS, it's Kubernetes, it's so many technologies combined and you won't find any expert in all of it. So there's any there's always some training required to have somebody um, working on your stack. So, and then having those, uh, those moments where we saw that the people were able to train themselves in Elixir on, to be honest, um, rough conditions with our platform. Yeah, I, I think uh, it kind of dissolved this, this issue regarding recruitment for us, but if we would l want to spread the topic further to the organization, then we definitely have to answer those questions again. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. I have one question. What was the, like, the most important reason that you decided to pick Elixir for those, uh, building those internal tools in your organization? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So for us, um, our first self-service that we built with, with Elixir was um, this HTTP API uh, automation. And there we were using this Red Hat, uh, Red Hat API platform. So in order to provision such an API, we had to do around 25 different HTTP calls to different endpoints. Then we had to provision an IDP, which uh, we were not in charge of, and so on, multiple different systems. And the possibility to first um, like isolate and uh, those those requests to to them and to uh, have the extra fault tolerance on top of it was very helpful for us so i was looking at those kind of properties and then obviously with my background i thought um, it would be the perfect uh, uh, match for it all right um are there any more questions Maybe a small one, um, but, but this is a bit of a technical question. So, so uh, if I understand correctly, you use Elixir to implement some kind of, like workflows in in your company. So, you know, so are you using any kind of like um, I don't know BPM thing, or is it like just hand coding every like all the process? It's it's basically hand coding. So oh, okay. after after like the first uh, two iterations of it, we we figured out that there are many common functionalities which we can reuse for, for other self-services and then we basically factor those out in, in, in own libraries with own behaviors and so on. So that enabled us to, to, uh, to create new self-services following the same GitOps pattern uh, pretty quickly. But no BPM. <laughs> okay, I have one question. Um, yeah, I'll get to you in a second. Uh, maybe for the management, what was actually the thing that impressed them the most? I don't know who, <laughs> who wants to answer the question. Uh, what me impressed is that uh, we, <coughs> Andre told it, that we, we changed the architecture a lot. We, we were discovering new situations, new uh, requirements, and we were always able to, to respond uh, to these new requirements very quickly, very stable. So we, we went to production very fast, um, we, and we ever stayed productive. So it wasn't ever a problem to, to do this whole architecture changes. And that is what me express, uh, what me <clears throat> um, convinced the most. All right, thank you. So one final question. And I know this is a dangerous position to be in between launching people, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, did you have any security constraints and how did you overcome them? Like, for example, uh, downloading packages for Hex and, uh, yeah. Um, basically, those security constraints are taken care of our security department, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, for, for the people developing with Node.js and Java, like all the, the requests for fetching packages go to Nexus, and Nexus then act, acts as a proxy server to some of the uh, publicly available um, uh, infrastructure. But as said, as we are not in, uh, able to integrate with this uh, package repository, we are basically on ourselves and have to take extra care on what kind of libraries we use. But there's, at the moment, uh, not an 
uh, a solved issue besides using SNUC, as I mentioned before, which does some dependency vulnerability scanning uh, for us. But besides that, we haven't done anything else. Thank you.